What's up my comic book brothers and my comic book sisters from another mister. Today we're going to do a full story review of Edge of Spider-Verse issues number one through five. The end of the Spider-Verse is coming to an end as we know it. Brought to you by Rated Comics. Before we get into the content, timestamps will be in description if you wish to go from issue to issue. Also, link in description if you wish to purchase any of the comic books in this review. Support the art, support the industry. Last but not least, if you like the content that we're throwing up, you know what to do. Like the video and subscribe to this channel because here at Rated Comics we do awesome comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway. Plus, it'll help us to make more comic book content like this. With all that being said, Let's get into it. I promise you guys at the end of the video, I am going to explain why I did a comic book review of Edge of Spider-Verse. The reason may or may not shock you, but if you've seen the video on Instagram and on YouTube shorts, I think you get the gist of it. But we begin this issue with on Earth. The year is 1740. The spider laird is caught by a bunch of young girls and not caught in the kind of way that you and I would probably want to be caught with. And for all my comic book sisters from another mister that are watching this video, I just throw out jokes like that, okay? While he searches for his goat and traps soldiers in a web, I don't know if they're French or they're British soldiers, these women inform spider laird that they are like him. Travelers through time, they tell him that very soon a war is about to break up for which he might be needed. And he's like, a war? What war? I mean, he just doesn't know, but hey, he's game to help out wherever he's needed, you know? We are then introduced to Anya Corazon from Earth 616 as we jump forward into this panel, better known as Araña, Spanish for spider. She's been this vigilante for quite some time now, swinging from building to building while juggling her student life at the Empire State University. And look, I've been in college. I mean, it's not easy to juggle life and have a social life, get good grades, and also have a social life and manage Jack in the Box tacos at two in the morning because I was a broke college student. Maybe you didn't relate to that, maybe you do. But sorry to get off topic. Like other Spider-Men from different universes or Spider-Women from different universes, Aranya knows she must serve this city. We we also get to see the origin of her power and the mark that she has in her arm as she makes impact on the ground. And she just loses her webbing, and for whatever reason she loses her webbing, Aranya then has visions of Madam Web telling her about a threat that has returned. So Madam Web caused her to lose her weapon, her webbing because I got to get her attention, she's got to get her attention. And it's a grave threat for which she must unite with other spider men and or women in the multiverse. She then wakes up because her visions are nothing less than a nightmare. As she wakes up, she sees webs all over and she struggles to get them off, but her roommate enters her room to take this textbook and realizes that something isn't right with Aranya. Aranya suits up and swings outside of her dorm room to fight against men who have turned into rats. That's after she deals with her roommate situation and okay, she 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 got she does a close one there to not reveal her true secret identity. She fights them off one by one and she tells them to back off because she wants to talk about their leader. As her chat starts, or lack of a chat, Madam Webb pulls Aranya into a portal and the two stand on top of a roof. Madam Webb reminds her of how she's an integral part of their team in this war that has gone loose. I mean, you keep telling Aranya about this war, why could you just tell her all about it on the first visit? Or maybe you gotta give her in fragments so you can keep the reader like myself interested. <laughs> hey, whatever, I'll go with the flow, you know? Madam Webb explains that her powers are in transition and they're returning to their totemic self. The grave danger that is upon our heroes is of the sisterhood. Aranya gets her new costume to gear up in the battle from Web Weaver, and she loves the vibe and I gotta admit this new costume right here yeah I'm kind of digging it too why not I mean you, you it's kind of hard to go against a new costume I mean then again it might be easily is but I dig it man I kind of dig it comment below let me know what you guys think about this new costume Aranya comes up against Delilah an essential member of the sisterhood and she has crashed a middle concert as soon as Delilah is about to hurt these people and all this ruckus and pandemonium is about to ensue Aranya webs her arms up. And you can tell after she webs her arm up, that is not enough. As Aranya lands on her feet, the pain she felt back in her bedroom turns up again. And that's how she woke up in the previous panel. She is then easily beaten in a fist fight by Delilah. Now Aranya is down, but not for long, not up because what seemed to be pain was a power building inside of her. She then destroys Delilah in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and right from the start of the fight, it is coming for Delilah. Aranya's fist and then Delilah's face on the floor, that's how you do a girl fight, that's what we all want to see. Soon, 
a vast portal opens up and Madam Web appears again. Ayanya is probably used to these entrances by now. And I guess us as the reader, we gotta be used to it too. She informs her and she informs us that she is needed for another battle somewhere else. And her fight against Delilah is just the start. The threat still hasn't subsided for Madam Web. Ayanya and company are now needed and we're gonna find out more on the next coming issues. And that's where we end this issue of Edge of Spider-Verse issue number one. Now, this is a very strong entry in my part. Each tale feels like it's building towards something, giving readers a different flavor of Spider-Man. There are three other different stories in this book and I'm gonna leave that out. That way I can leave some meat on the bone with you guys. And as promised, the reason why I'm doing Edge of Spider-Verse one, well, I think I need more Spider-Man content on the YouTube channel. And two, let's get to the real answer here. Rated Comics does have an exclusive of Spider-Man issue number one, which is a continuation of the story of Edge of Spider-Verse. Whether you're an average comic book reader or not, or you're just a comic book collector, this is a Rated Comics exclusive. The standard cover is limited to 3,000 in print, and the Virgin cover is limited to 1,000 in print. Hey, you know what? When it turns to exclusivity and Spider-Man being a very commercially popular superhero, hey, exclusivity and a popular the superhero that is a winning formula to add to your comic book collection in my opinion and you can only get this cover in one place link in the description if you wish to add that comic book to your comic book collection now you know why i'm doing this video and you know i rated comics we do awesome comic book reviews okay we begin this issue with the girls preparing for their concert in Earth 65 while Mysterio lurks in the shadows. Unbeknown to him, Spider Gwen is on his trail and prepared for all this and she looks like to bring him down once and for all to avoid Mysterio's deadly gas. She wears a gas mask to this gas fight. Funny thing is, the fight is taking place where the girls are performing their concert. Spider Gwen has had enough of Mysterio's games and smashes his helmet with her manicured fists. Well, at least I think they're manicured. What do you mean by that? Mysterio is later arrested and goes with the authorities. Then Mary Jane takes the stage to perform with another artist as the story shifts to the city of London in Earth 834. Mayor Sweeney's mining project might have hit a gold mine or a major disaster. What will it be? We are yet to find out. Just like this brother from behind the tree. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to find out, but I just put that up there because that is literally my favorite meme of all time. And it makes me laugh when I see it. But anyways, back to the content. Meanwhile, in South London, Zarina and Zoe are gaming in their room. Then we get to know that Zarina is killing her time until sunset, the time when she gets to break her fast. She has one hour left until she could break her fast. She checks her phone. Suddenly, there's a loud sound nearby, which completely shakes Zarina and Zoe. Zarina knows it's got to be much more than what they're telling on the news. It ain't just what it is, it's gotta be something more than that. Zarina suits up, and that is when we see that she is Spider UK. When she arrives at the disaster spot, she notices a wyvern causing all the distress, not a dragon. As the news said, the brigadier who assists Spider UK, kind of like the Alfred to Spider UK, assists her in her missions, tells her to stand down and not to engage. Zarina is just like any other Spider-Man in an alternate universe, not willing to stand by and watch the bad guys take over. The dragon throws up some kind of contagion, which mutates the people below. Before webbing up one of these weird creatures, Zanina looks to get a sample of some chemicals in her hand from, from them, which might have the ability to reverse the occurrence of these beasts and possibly save the people in reversing their mutation. Very risky, but it's gotta be done. However, it seems a little impossible considering one of the creatures just got loose from their webby. In between a big flash, a distraction which allows Zanina to escape from the creature, and unbeknownst to the creature, she has escaped into the sewers. It was her intended plan to head to the sewers after all. Here she meets Alistar Stewart, a scientist at WHO, Wired Happenings Organization. That's what that's what WHO stands for. And it also happens to be the organization Sidina works for. Stewart cooks up tranquilizing darts from the creature's bio which Sidina received earlier. The darts will neutralize its effects and possibly reverse the transformation to the people infected. She then deals with the giant dragon and tries to shoot them while with the tranquilizing darts. Although she misses, the dragon flies away and she is hopeful that her chance will come. 
Zyrenia has to exert more of herself to contain the dragon just because she is fasting, so she's weakened. Her silk glands aren't refilling fast enough, and she is operating at 50% of her capabilities. Just to give you an idea, at 100%, she could bench press 15,000 tons, which is 3,000 pounds. The dragon weighs 20,000 pounds, and operating at 50% means she can only bench 15,000 pounds, so she's got 5,000 pounds of excess that she has to figure out how to deal with. Bringing down the dragon might not be easy for Zedina because the dragon proceeds to fly toward the French church building without stopping. Sardinia has to let go and improvise. She remembers something about spiders using Earth's electric field to fly. The portion of the charge thread which will provide the necessary lift, this method is called ballooning. Think of it like falling with style. She tries to land on the building right over the Fen Church building, but her landing is so bad that she falls face first. There, she meets Stuart's sister, who tells her that they will attract all those flying monsters toward them because that is the only way they could be taken down. Luckily, Stuart has applied a method where the darts will change into gas neutralizers, making Zyrenia and his sister's job easy. Or will it be as easy as it seems? Zydina then unleashes an electric jolt of more than 8,000 volts to bring down those beasts. And as the gas acts upon them, these beasts turn back to their original people that they were. The army takes down the dragon crawling in the sky, and as the dragon threat is averted, Zanina's phone chimes in to remind her that it's time to break her fast. She recites the prayer and pops medjool dates in her mouth that she was craving all this time. When suddenly, Madame Webb appears and tells Zanina that it's time of the essence and she is needed to save the fate of all the Spider-Man in the multiverses. Then the story shows back to Earth. 001. Now before I go into this story, I gotta mention that Rated Comics does have an exclusive of Spider-Man issue number one, which does take place after the storyline of Edge of Spider-Verse, which is why we're covering it. It's a Rated Comics exclusive. It's a Gabriel Del Alto cover. It's exclusive only to Rated Comics. It's limited to 3,000 print the standard cover, and the version is limited to 1,000 in printing. Link in description if you wish to add that to your comic book collection. You don't even have to read the comic book. Just look at it. It's add, just added it to it. It's rare. It's exclusive, and it's really cool to look at. But with all that being said, back into the content. Here, Shathra and Neith argue while the elders have tasked the former to cast a celestial map of humanity. The entire event took place centuries ago. That is clear. Although it looks like a weak effort, Shathra calls her creation the Great Nest, a place where every soul will grow and evolve until they are ready to become one with the hive. Neith, however, has her ideas of construction and starts creating a golden web on the trees in front of her. The two mothers come about and applaud Neith while they realize that Shathra might have been given a bigger responsibility that she could handle. Shathra separates herself from the three and delves into a pool of hatred and jealousy. With her work not being appreciated enough, she transforms into an evil version of herself where she becomes a nest for wasp. She promises that the nest will always get the better of spiders as her skin tone turns dark. She then waits for someone to disrupt her network so that she could turn them into her nestling. As luck would have it, this is about to go down and that's where we end this issue. I mean, in my opinion, Edge of Spider-Verse issue number two is, it starts to continually to slowly unveil the main threat. But if you have the patience for it, I think it's kind of a rewarding read. Not only does it feature an electric new spider superhero, but it also gives readers something substantial to cling on to, figuring out where this conflict is gonna go next. But then again, hey, I'm only doing this because, yeah, I do need more Spider-Man content on the on the Rated Comics YouTube channel. And also, hey, we got a Rated Comics exclusive Spider-Man issue number one, which takes place of the events after Edge of Spider-Verse. And if you ain't got to read it, just add that comic book to your comic book collection. But I'll stop with all that. As promised, at the end of this video, I am going to announce the winner of the Spider-Man issue number one rated comics exclusive, limited to 3,000 in print. So just stick with me to the end of the video and I will announce the winner. But with all that being said, let's get into the content. We begin this issue of Edge of Spider-Verse with Pavatil Prakabar, also known as the Indian Spider-Man. If I've pronounced his name incorrectly, forgive me for that internet. His universe is Earth 50101, and he tells us he's met other Spider-Men and other Spider-Girls and other Spider-People. He is not a guest in the multiverse because he knows everything about it. Another thing we should know about Spider-Man from this universe is he loves to eat. I mean, come on now, Tyree said it best. Like I said, we hungry. 
and he can eat anything at any time, just like any other South Asian. Pavatir has no parents, but he does have a clear dear aunt called Maya. I mean, when you're dealing with different spider verses, different Spider-Man, Aunt May, Aunt Maya, Aunt Papaya, I mean, you guys get the, you guys get the thing here. Now, Aunt Maya loves him very much, and he has an uncle named Behim. Bing. B H I M. I think it, I think it's Behim. Anyways, he misses his uncle Behim very much. Pavatir got his spider powers from an ancient yogi whom he came across. Pavatir's duties and principles are clear. If he's not going to do what he does, then who will? We then head to Earth 194 at the Delvadian Embassy on the night of the Ambassador's Ball. The famous tarantula of his country, the tarantula spider, gold spider, is on display and Felicia Hardy has her eyes on it as she dances with the ambassador. He's suspicious of it, like should I put my tarantula spider out to get you to dance with me more often? And she's like, boy, we are the real attraction here, not that spider. It turns out the dance was part of Felicia's plan because all this time she's been trying to get the ambassador's fingerprint because she would be able to open the safe and she also puts a it on his shoulder during their dance so she can you know keep ta keep tabs on him but the safe is containing the tarantula that was on display and she intends and she's gonna take it so she clears all the lasers in the security room and that seems easy for felicia until she puts her hands on the tarantula spider which pinched her security is immediately alerted and although felicia feels dizzy she needs to get out of there immediately because the police will be there any moment holding the tarantula in her hand felicia is transported somewhere outside magically it seems like mysteriously as if she doesn't recall how she got there it's as if the tarantula has some power or something another thing she notices is that she is standing upside down outside but that's not where Felicia stops. She has a few more artifacts that she has her eyes on. And even if her best friend is a detective, there are some things you just can't stop. However, Felicia's concern is getting the public to change the name they're using for her. They're calling her because she doesn't like the sound of Spider Thief. She likes the sound of Night Spider better. So our Night Spider now goes after Wilson's Fisk clay tablet because she fused it as a challenge when her friend, Mary Jane, we're talking about, you know, Wilson's Fist Clay Tab is going to be highly secured and that spider thief is not going to get it, but Night Spider will. She enters his property, evades all the booby trapping using her tarantula spider senses and proceeds to make her way towards the safe. Cracking the safe is the easiest part for her as she acquires the clay tab without breaking a sweat. As Detective Jean investigates the scene and she gets bitched out by her, her superior, she goes through a wave of depression as all the artifacts which she was keeping safe were the ones that got stolen. Oh, that's not going to make her job easy for her now. Not knowing all this time her best friend is behind all this, she calls Felicia, actually correction, Felicia calls her to check up on things and Mary Jane's like, man, it's all bad time and to be fair, it's all bad time so talk to me girl, what's up? Felicia says she wants her to come over to talk to her. To her horror, Jean visits Felicia's penthouse and sees the tarantula there. As she moves her head and she sees Felicia with all the artifacts and cash in her possession. A stunned Jean cannot say anything while Felicia confesses that she is the night spider and since she got her powers, rubbing stuff hasn't been fun. She was doing all that because she was the thrill of it. It was the thrill that kept her going. Call her like the Selena Kyle, the cat woman of the Marvel Universe in this edge of Spider-Verse complexion. But things have been too easy and it simply feels overpowered and so she just hands herself over to Jean to arrest her because there's no more thrill. The thrill is gone. Put me away. I'm no good here. As Jean puts the handcuffs around her wrist, there is a glowing light out of thin air. A woman appears asking for Felicia help for a completely hopeless cause. Intrigued and now feeling like a newfound purpose is driven from within, Felicia immediately breaks free from the cuffs and hops into the portal. Jean is stunned yet again. She wonders what to do next. Now, in this Edge of Spider-Verse issue number three, before we go into this breakdown right here, you know, I'm just gonna summarize it real quick. I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna announce the winner for the Edge of Spider-Verse issue number three giveaway. So I put all the names that enter into the giveaway into this random wheel spin. Let's see who won.
Congratulations, my brother from another mother, and thank you for entering. What I need you to do is to go on our Instagram or TikTok, send us a DM, let us know that you won, that you entered the giveaway, and congratulations, brother. Just send us the best address to mail your Spider-Man issue number one rated comments exclusive to. Thank you again for entering. So we're just gonna wrap up the content real quick. We then meet Sakura Spire, who tells us how her life changed two years ago when she was bit by a radioactive spider. The girl named Haruka, her father was killed by Hydra agents who were after her when they learned of her powers. Her father once told her, with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, come on now, when it's all this universe is a Spider-Man, it's like they align or they're parallel, but they all have different origins and a little bit of different flavor to it, you know what I mean? But she was too young to understand what any of this meant at that time. Ever since her father passed away, she's been saving people and inspiring them to live for others. This isn't where Sakura Spider journey stops though. Her courage has gotten Madame Webb to reach out to her because the fate of every spider is at risk. And she is part of a team that will save the spider people in the multiverse. And that is where we end this review of Edge of Spider-Verse issue number three. I mean, my personal opinion, it kind of took, it's, it's taken, I know you're dealing with a lot of characters here and you're, it's not easy to gel all of them together. I, in my personal opinion, I think it's taking too long to actually get to the villain. And my concern is with issues four and five, it's going to be too quick of a conclusion, too quick, not not fleshing it out. That's just my opinion. But hey, you know, if you guys want me to finish it through with Edge of Spider-Verse issues number four and five and do the complete review, comment below, let me know. And congratulations to my brother from another mother to winning the Spider-Man issue number one rated comics exclusive giveaway. If you guys like to add that comic book to your comic book collection or any comic books to your comic book collection on this channel or if you're a collector just like collecting cool stuff, covers, art, check out our website ratedcomics.com, link in description. And also don't forget that if you guys are WhatNot users or if you have the WhatNot app, we do online auctions on WhatNot as well. In the 616 universe, we are introduced to Peter Porker, the fearless and ever so brave Spider-Ham. <laughs> Man, I'm hungry after reading this. Beating up on criminals and dropping pig-related punchlines and hopefully pig-related dishes. Okay, I'll stop with the pork jokes. That is what Porker does best, minus the pork dishes. Right now, he lives his best life doing these two things. It seems like another typical day for Porker, but then he comes across Pete Spider-Man, who asked Porker how he got his powers and all the usual questions like what do you do, what happened, I mean tell me more about yourself, that you would ask a Spider-Man. It's rather long, but since this is a Spider-Verse we are talking about, this brother spider power origins has like a HGTV, House Hunter, Barka Hunters kind of storyline to it. For example, instead of Green Goblin, the name is Green Lawn Goblin and Craven the House Flipper. You can check it out if you decide to get the comic. Porker, however, was confused, probably just like you and I too, <laughs> as to who Pete was. Porker tells him off by saying that he is the laziest superhero in the entire multiverse. Damn, that's pretty low, bro. Pete listens closely, but someone yells out for help in the distance. Then the two see a fire in a building and a little girl is trapped at the top. Without a second thought, Peter goes to save the girl even though Porker tells him to stay out the way. This act of bravery from Pete was enough to convince Porker that Pete too is Spider-Man at the end of the day. The two tell each other goodbye and hope to meet each other again sometime down the line. Porker swings off but is immediately interrupted in his swing by an insect. Just like my car gets interrupted by an insect after I get it washed and they conveniently decide to interrupt my clean windshield. It's an annoying feeling but anyways. We then switch to Earth 423 where Princess Petra is going through the market with the disguise on her head. It is because she doesn't want to be identified in public. Petra has a robotic spider on her arm at all times whom she calls Webster. This has like an Aladdin kind of feel to it. Princess Jasmine, anyone? I mean, anyways. Okay, so suddenly there is a loud boom and that just messes everything up and no more musical. We see that Bishop Octopus has arrived with all her might. She probably hungry too. James the musician dares to get brave and Bishop Octopus threatens him that, you know what, you're going to be singing at your own funeral with your own funeral tune if you keep this up, bruh. Petra takes the frying pan and smacks it into Octopus's face. The octopus grabs her with one of her tentacles and as Petra Hood comes off of her, her cover is blown. Octopus leaves her because she is searching for an orb which she has to find at all costs before the ball takes place tonight. Petra too forgets about the ball and she is reminded of it and she immediately runs home. Petra goes to her mother who is the queen of the land. 
She looks like the evil queen from Snow White. You guys can probably guess how old I am from these references. And if you get the references, it's all good because these movies are classics. Her mother tells her how worried she has been. She doesn't give Petra permission to go to the ball, despite how badly Petra wants to go, because she fears for her daughter's life. She locks Petra's door and says she can't attend the ball because it will be too dangerous. We all know that the king, Petra's father, was murdered by the assassin not too long ago. Sorry, not the assassin, a assassin, which remains a mystery whoever this assassin is. Petra looks into her mirror and says she wishes things would be different. The next moment, a witch appears out of thin air. Much to Petra's shock, she introduces herself at Petra's gob mother, not godmother, gob mother and she is in the form of a goblin she introduces herself as norma i mean like a norman osborne reference i mean you got to love the references and the similarities to the main spider-man universe seeing how desperately she wants to head to the ball norma grants petra a wish and gives petra a beautiful outfit with spider powers the only condition is that when the clock strikes midnight she can choose between her powers or love it was difficult for Petra to digest as she now is known for Princess Spintress. At the ball, Princess Spintress makes her entrance, but she has to be careful and not get distracted. Royalty from all over the kingdoms are in attendance. Webster informs her of that, which is her robotic spider. She also discovers that with her new powers, she can understand Webster to her surprise. Okay, well, these new powers come with perks now. The queen welcomes the people from the six kingdoms claiming that an assassin had killed her husband. A man gets up looking like J. Jonah Jameson in this universe claiming that she is lying and that her dark magic practices killed him, not the assassin. She has him seized and tells him that he's spewing lies up in here like nah -uh, bro this is my party and it's my party and I'll cry if I want to kind of deal. A fight breaks out and Princess Spencer's webs Bishop Octopus from doing any more damage. Before I go any further with the content, link in description if you wish to add this comic book or any of the other comic books to your comic book collection. Support the art, support the industry. The queen takes an orb that she was concealing, puts it on her head, and transforms into the mysterious empress with the orb in her possession. Face to face with Spintress, not knowing it's her daughter, she refuses to recognize her because of the orbs holding her back. I mean, her daughter did accidentally yell out mom before attacking. The daughter and mother do go neck and neck with each other, with Spintress unable to keep up at the start. However, the fight proceeds, the clock strikes midnight, and Spintress still needs her power to save the people at the ball. That's a tough position to be in, and it makes things more interesting. She shortens her dress, removing all the excess webbing to move faster, and uses one of the octopus's tentacles to spray ink on her mother's orb helmet. She then proceeds to kick her helmet and break it. She saves the people and the ball, but knows she can never love again. The only love she'll be doing at this time for the rest of her life is the love of being a hero. But she can't love romantically. She also loses a slipper somewhere during the fight. As the man asks for my lady's name, she says it's Spentress. Suddenly, there's a large boom and a portal in front of her opens up. Madam Webb tells Spentress that her magic is desperately needed right now. We are also introduced to Spider Mobile from Earth 5393 whose real identity is Peter Partcar. As he saves a few cars from the bad cars, Sparta UK shows up and recruits him on behalf of Madam Webb for the upcoming big mission. Spider Mobile jumps right into the portal. It's four pages of story, but I'm going to leave some meat on the bone if you decide to get this comic. Link in description, by the way. We also have really cool rated comics exclusives on our website, especially the Spider-Man issue number one rated comics exclusive. Cover artist is Gabriel Del Alto, and that story takes place after the events of Edge of Spider-Verse. Just want to throw it out there for you casual readers or collectors out there watching. But that's not all though. We are also introduced to Sun Spider from Earth 223. She is Charlotte Weber, handicapped in real life but a spider hero who saves people like any other spider. Bitten by a radioactive spider three years ago gave her powers, but she couldn't get rid of her disease. She is confined to a wheelchair when she isn't fighting crime, and she heads to a party with her three friends. At the party, there's no ramp for her wheelchair, and we get a layer of character about Charlotte. She swears everyone knows what's best for her. She understands that everyone means well when they're helping her out, but she feels she can stick up for herself. She doesn't want to feel like a baby. She conveys that she can handle things on her own, a little bit of pride, but in other words, 
treat her like a human being that's capable. There, she confronts Octo Octavius, who tries to help her by trying to experiment with his tentacles on her. She denies it, and Octavius goes into a rage to destroy the party. Damn, brother, we all been rejected. It's all good. Charlotte then switches to the spider suit and saves the day with his stamina, another superhero. All these superheroes just coming out of nowhere in this multiverse? I mean, okay, it's a party now. I mean, then at the end of the day, Doc Ock is then arrested. Finally arrested, he's finally subdued. In handcuffs, he yells like he only wanted Charlotte to see what freedom these legs could give her. <laughs> but it seems Charlotte has accepted her condition with grace. As for Charlotte, she's about to dance with Aster. But before that dance can happen, she is contacted by Madden Web. That's like, why did I get like a thing of Captain America, you know, asking Petty Carter for that last dance and she just waits for that last dance. But anyways, Charlotte is contacted by Madden Web because Web thinks that Charlotte is ready for what's coming. More than Charlotte, they need Sun Spider on their side. And that is the end of this issue of Edge of Spider-Verse, issue number four. Okay, I mean, at first I was kind of complaining about just what you're gathering all these heroes, when are we gonna get to the villain? I wonder if we're gonna get to the villain at the end of issue number five, or if all these issues are just gonna be, it's all a recruitment so we get to know all these Spider-Verses, then this next issue is gonna be all about this, who this new villain is. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm gonna review issue number five because that is the last piece of the issue, last piece of the story for Edge of Spider-Verse. So yeah, uh, stick around for that, like the video, subscribe to this channel with all that being said the story starts in Zimbabwe on earth 31 where Sergi Kravinov the celebrated hunter is hunting a legendary lion as he seeks to hunt down this lion he comes across it and finds it already dead as he looks to skin the animal he is attacked from behind by a giant spider which stings Kravinov and puts its fangs into its shoulders that's one way to get spider powers in another universe right the story switches to New York City three months later where J Jonah Jameson addresses the public and tells them how super villains have terrorized their city. These are people who have no respect for the law. They aren't humans, they're animals, says J. Jonas Jameson. And to counter these beasts, Jameson has hired Craven, the hunter spider. Craven first faces off against Reiner, who he comfortably beats like tell your mama to save me a plate kind of beatdown. Jameson promises Craven an impressive reward, which is why he has taken upon himself to exterminate all these men taking the shape of different animals in the city. The rhino is the first one to go down. As he defeats the rhino, the police demand he hands over rhino so they could put him behind bars. Craven disagrees and tells the police to take Rhino away from him if they can. If you have the courage, do that. If you don't, stay out of my way. He walks away with Rhino. We then see Craven's property, a small townhouse with all of his victims as Craven's trophies, taxidermy style, if you will. As he looks around and admires them, wasps enter his house from the floorboards, air vents, and wall cracks. They start to attack him, but he eats and chews them away instead of shooing them away. <laughs> okay. The Spider biting him heightened his senses and increased his tolerance to spider toxins. Insect stings do not affect him whatsoever. Craven then proceeds to open a portal and walk through it. On the other side, he sees Madame Webb, Aranya, and Zarina discussing how to stop Shathra and the Wasp army. They are stunned by Craven's ability to walk through a portal. He explains to them that he is a hunter and walking through portals is what he does, and he is here to help the team and put this beast down once and for all. The story then shifts to Earth 71490 where we hear Cooper Cohen's story. Cooper saves his friend Peter Parker from a spider. Instead, the spider bites Cooper. Cooper then gets spider-like powers and begins to save people in the city with the hidden identity of Web Weaver. And before we go any further, if you're liking the content so far, you know what to do. Like the video and subscribe to this channel. We do awesome comic book reviews, comic book related content with the occasional comic book giveaway. Back into the content. Cooper works for Janet Van Dyne, who gave up the superhero life for the fashion industry, and now she's thriving in it. As she passes through her employees' kind of walk and debrief kind of thing at the same time, she goes into her office and we see that Janet Van Dyne, who is out in public, is an imposter, whereas the real one is hidden in the fake one's closet. Unbeknownst to anyone else, you know that's got to be Chameleon. Speaking of unbeknown, I bet you guys didn't know that this comic sets up a new Spider-Man issue number one. 
Well, you probably we did, but I bet you didn't know about our Rated Comics exclusive Spider-Man issue number one, Rated Comics exclusive cover artist by Gabriel Delato. The trade is limited to 3,000 and the Virgin is limited to 1,000. Link in description if you wish to add that to your comic book collection. Back into the story, Web Weaver goes out into the city hoping she could get her hands on someone committing crime. And even though he does find one happening, he is stopped by Silk. Silk of Earth 71490, another vigilante, just not the Cindy Moon vigilante, at least not in this universe. The next evening, Van Dyne is hosting one of the biggest fashion shows in the city. Cooper arrives, but since he can't find Van Dyne, he realizes something is wrong. Well, so his spider senses tell him. In this panel right here, Van Dyne takes Millie, one of the models, into the restroom, telling her to try something on special. Instead, she knocks her out, takes up her appearance as a shapeshifter. Things do not look good. Web Weaver senses it and picks out that Millie isn't acting normal on the ramp. Web Weaver's prediction is correct. It is Camille who was hired to kill Silver Slabanova. Web Weaver quickly subdues Camille and ties him up in the web that he's weaved in. Suddenly, UK Spider emerges from a portal and requests Web Weaver's help. Albeit confused, Web Weaver has no option but to go. However, before going to save the multiverse, he does kiss the guy in the crowd. As they kiss, he bids Weaver farewell, goodbye, telling her that they'll continue from here once he returns. Web Weaver steps into the portal to save the spider heroes and the multiverse, and that is the end of this issue of Edge of Spider-Verse issue number 5. I mean, I think it's a decent issue to finish off the Edge of Spider-Verse series. Hunter Spider Story, as silly as it may seem, that was the best story of this issue in my personal opinion. Now, overall, I mean, I think it's a decent issue, what I feel it's lacking. I, I, I don't know if I need a full five series issues to introduce all the Spider-Verses and all the, in each universe. Then again, because there's so many of them, you probably want to build up their characters. So when you go into the big climatic scene in the next issue, it has a payoff because it feels more personal and you know all the Spider-Verses in each universe personally. If you're a key issue collector of the comics, then link in the description if you wish to add this comic book to your comic book collection because it's the first appearance of Sergi Kravinoff, Cooper Cohen, Albert Moon J, Janet Van Dyne, and Cindy Moon, and others in different universes. So if you're a key issue collector, this may be a comic you, you may want to add to your comic book collection. But what are your thoughts? Comment below, let me know. With all that being said, Edge of Spider-Verse issue number five. If you like the content we're throwing up, don't be shy, don't be stingy. Like the video, subscribe to this channel, and also this video is sponsored by coffee. So if you'd like to buy your boy a cup of coffee, link in description or donate to the super thanks. But the greatest compliment you guys can do is by liking this video and subscribing to this channel. Thank you again for watching. Until next time.